Hey, it's Hugh Hewitt, and when I want to know what's going on with the Cavs, the Browns, and the Tribe, I tune into Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Hey guys, J-Rock here from the Sports Fix, and we always talk about using our platform to try to help the world and the society we live in, and everywhere I go and everywhere we go, bullying is one of the problems in today's society. There's nothing worse than any person, big or small, strong or weak, adult or child, feeling picked on, pushed around, vulnerable, and victimized at the hands of a bully. Change comes one person at a time, and my good friends that know such thing as a bully are working on skills and techniques and ways that we can all change and make things better for everyone. Find out more at nosuchthingasabully.com. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Catch every UFC pay-per-view live in full HD at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, just outside Great Northern Mall. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. And away we go. There we go. Let's launch this bad boy. Welcome in, you guys. J-Rock with you here. Jerry Myers kicking things off another week. We are live on the air, off and running with the sports fix. It's the second week, second full week anyway here of January. And I'll tell you what, man, we're getting rolling in 2016 already, guys. How was your weekend here? First snowfall for us over here, and I'm good, man. That's fine. Uh, I kind of cursed myself, looked at my son over the weekend, and I said, man, we're, we're, what, nine, ten days into January here? I said, shoot, we got less than two months of winter left. This could be the greatest winter of your life, son. I said, you'll, you'll always be talking about the winter where it never snowed. So kicked in a little bit yesterday, but that's nothing. I guess in some of the snowbell parts, they got it worse. But I'm good here. A little dusting yesterday, just enough to remind you it's winter. And uh, this is nothing if you're from Cleveland. But the snow has finally begun to fall. Although I will tell you, we'll, we'll talk about it here in a minute. My weekend consisted of, uh, of of only a few things. Uh, uh, it consisted of some NFL playoffs, obviously. Uh, my weekend consisted of hitting the gym. My weekend consisted of, let's see, it started Friday night with a, with a game, rolled through. We watched some playoffs. We watched the Cavs. We hit the gym, and we watched uh, that, uh, what's the, the thing? that? Oh, yeah, that thing that's catching everybody, making a murderer. Let me tell you something. Talk about falling into the show hole. I, I sure did there. I'll talk to you. That's binge worthy right there. Uh, had a fun weekend. I don't know about you guys, but I sure did. Getting ready to run through it all with you, and we'll get Dan Wismar in on the conversation today. A whole lot to get into. We'll talk about the Cavs, the Browns, we'll coaching search. I'll all the latest going on with them. The NFL playoffs here this past weekend. At national title game going on. There is a whole lot for us to get into. Some monsters, some Vikings, some Buckeyes. Dan's going to join us. You guys as well. So let's do it. Lock it, load it. Let's get off and running with the sports fix. J-Rock with you here, as I said. Jerry Myers, the big daddy on the microphone, whatever you will. Thanking you for joining us. Welcome into the sports fix live across the sports fix radio network. Some of you enjoying the show live on TuneIn and its radio and mobile app. On Spreaker, perhaps, Mixler. Oh, speaking of, by the way, uh, since the last time we were on the air, this is just a nifty little thing. And when it does come through, I'll have it. Um, I'm going to be allowed to uh, add it to our broadcast here. So you guys will be able to hear it as soon as it does. But I got an email the other day from the people at Spreaker. It's what made me think to, uh, to tell you guys about this just the other day. And apparently they are doing a national radio campaign for Spreaker for the platform of podcasting and all of that. And they are a property of iHeartMedia, iHeartRadio, which used to be Clear Channel. So all of those stations nationwide, well, they're doing a big national radio commercial. And uh, they asked us for permission the other day to sample the sports fix as part of the campaign that they're doing. Now, I can't tell you what that means, how much of a feature that will be, but... We will be involved in some way, shape, or form in the national radio campaign promoting Spreaker, which is pretty cool. They've always been 
big supporters of what we do here, and I thought that was pretty cool. Hey, they uh, obviously think that what we bring to the table is good enough to feature as one of the things that would entice other people to get into the game and do the podcasting and all of that stuff. So I thought that was really cool, and it's just, again, a a compliment to you guys, this whole Sports Fix thing that we got going on. It's not just me. I I joke. I'm the one-man show behind the scenes, but it's all of us here that make this thing happen. So it's pretty cool, and eventually... When it comes out, I'll have it for you guys to listen to here, but it'll be all over the place, wherever you're at, all over. As we talk about the people that listen to the show, you'll probably come across it. Again, don't know exactly how much that will entail, but uh, when I know, you'll hear it, and we'll all we'll all listen to it and enjoy it together. But that was a pretty cool bit of thing uh, to find out over the weekend that Spreaker was going to feature us in their national campaign. So anyways, perhaps you're listening to us on the great places over there like Spreaker. Love those guys. Give them some love. On Mixler, on all of their respective digital and mobile apps, on the website, thesportsfix.net, our home base, the one-stop shop for everything. It's got the replays. It's got the social media widgets. It's got all the stuff you need, including listening to the show live right there, the home page the sportsfix.net make sure you bookmark it and put it there so in case you ever need i mean it's a great backup as well many people say hey i had trouble with this site that site couldn't get the show up and going so i just jumped over to the website and listened to it there the sports fix excuse me, the sports fix.net as well. Shout out to all of you, thousands of you around the world listening 24 seven on digital delay on sites like iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, iTunes, Stitcher radio, all of the different podcast services, all of the different places and sites, however you're doing it. You may have said, Hey, it's not where I listen to the show, wherever you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much for doing it and being with us and helping us do the thing and getting your fix. And as I say all the time, use, use, all of the methods possible to be a part of the show. We want you to interact with us. The phones are already ringing. They're open now. Dan Wismar is going to join us in about 15, 20 minutes, so I will have time to crack the phones. 216-539-7535 is the number to call. 216-539-7535. We're playing it live now on the air. But if you're listening on Digital Delay, you can still call. You can still hit us up. 24-7. We'll play those messages later. 216-539-7535. Facebook, Twitter, email, all the ways to stay in touch 24-7 real time. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Make sure you like the page today. Join the 25,000 strong on social media following what we do here. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix C L E and email us the Sports Fix at AOL.com, Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix, Twitter at the Sports Fix C L E email the Sports Fix at AOL.com. Real quick, uh, because I, I don't want to go back and forth in and out of sports, and I'm going to hit the phones here momentarily. I've got a couple of, of calls in queue, but. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, my weekend consisted of just a couple of things. They were sports, they were the gym, and they were making a murderer. I, I don't know. I'm, it's the thing. Everybody is is starting to uh, get into it now. It's been out for a couple of, couple of weeks, I believe, here on Netflix. It's a series about uh, a guy in Wisconsin. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy story. And I'm going to start right off the bat by saying I had to watch it. I binge-watched this series all the way through. And then I had to go do my own research afterwards. And I've got my own conclusions on this whole thing. But it's really mind-blowing because uh, whether you think that this man, Stephen Avery, who uh, crazy is this. It, this is a, It's an episode of Law & Order come to, come to real life. This guy, back in 1985, was falsely convicted of a sexual assault in uh, uh, Manawak County there in Wisconsin. And the county is important because they circle back into this thing. But uh, the guy spent 18 years in prison for... Many of you may have seen this because it's like the hot social media thing. If it's not, it's on Netflix. It's called Making a Murderer. It is it is amazing when you see it, although it is a documentary made to, to present a certain set of facts. And you have to keep that in mind when you watch it. But they present them very well, I will tell you that. And uh, anyways, so in 85, this guy, falsely convicted, does 18 years in the pokey. Finally, the Innocence Project, that, that national group that goes and finds people who have DNA evidence or have reasons to believe that they've been falsely convicted, they prove it. They find a new technology that didn't exist 
that was able to DNA test and prove that this guy didn't do it, even though it turned out that while he was in jail, somebody else had confessed to doing this crime. Uh, when it first went down, they had reasons to believe that somebody else may have done this, yet they still uh, ramrodded the prosecution towards Mr. Avery. So he does 18 years for a crime he didn't commit. And now he was no choir boy by any means. I've see, read into his past that he has a, definitely a very uh, sordid background, but not at the level of what he was accused of doing here. Uh, petty crimes, different things like that. But anyways, so he does 18 years. He gets out. Gets out in 2003 or whatever. Finally, he's freed, and he's going to sue the county for wrongful imprisonment. And and they, they offer him peanuts. I want to say the initial offer was like $1,000 a year. The going rate is, is more like $2 million a year when people are wrongly convicted and they end up filing lawsuits. So he files a 34, 35, 36, something like that million dollar lawsuit against uh, the county. And the sheriffs get, get uh, and the, the DA, all of these people get uh, depositions and they have to go testify and two weeks later uh, a a photographer from a, like a auto trader magazine selling or you know that sells vans and cars and all that stuff people put their cars and trucks in the magazine came to uh, photograph some stuff anyway somewhere during this day this woman comes up missing turns out later that she was murdered uh, the, the, the whole thing there's a whole story but uh, they, they circle right back around to this guy and from the get-go you see all of these ways that he quite and I'm gonna say that I went afterwards and I did my own research and there's plenty of details that were not put into this documentary that add to the to the prosecution side of things. I'm not going to sit here and yell and say, hey, Stephen Avery is innocent and there's an innocent man in prison and there's a second person involved as well. I will say that there's not a shred of doubt in my mind that there was a manipulation along the way. Even if, if you believe that this man committed this crime and then the police didn't have the evidence to prove it, so they planted some of it. That's exactly what you can draw conclusions to. I mean, there's no way a a person can watch this from beginning to end and not go, wow. I don't know if that guy did it or not, but I would never want to be in that situation because you can see where the, the, the cracks in our criminal justice system for as great of a country as we have and for as many freedoms as we have. The criminal justice system failed in a million different ways in this thing. And uh, very, very, very interesting. I'm telling you, you, you'll blow through the whole thing. It's like 10 episodes. You have to watch this. It's called Making a Murderer. And uh, uh, apparently there's already over 350, maybe closing in on 400,000 petitions. It went to the White House. It, it went viral. And the White House has to respond to any petition that gets over 100,000 votes or, or I mean, signatures on it. The White House said, hey, this is a state issue. We can't get involved. The governor of the state of Wisconsin said he's not going to uh, overturn this verdict. But there is a lot of work to try to make that exactly what I just said happen. Because I'll tell you what, when you watch this thing, it is Amazing, and again, I'm not I'm not impressed easily by television tricks. I get it. I've been in pro wrestling for almost 20 years. I know the the, the storytelling tricks and how to arc a story and tell the story that you want. But let me tell you, this th there is some meat to this. Whether or not you can go as far as some people and convince yourself that this man is completely innocent, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm saying it's a it's an eye opening experience to watch this uh, this series and see because there was definitely most definitely some at least some underhandedness and chicanery going on between the uh the, the sheriff's department that was by the way that town was going to go out of business 36 million dollars they the insurance company refused to make the payment the town was going to have to pay that lawsuit off. And boy, when you start to see the connections between certain police officers, there was evidence that after six or seven searches of the house was not found, that when these same police officers that were involved in the initial false arrest and the lawsuit and were going to be held responsible, when they get access to the property alone, these items are magically found on search number seven. And they're like key pieces of evidence. Even other, sh I'll tell you, there's amazing stuff in this. Again, I'm not trying to tell you that this guy is innocent because when you, you got to do what I did. After I watched it, I went and 
read on his case file. And the prosecutor, actually, just the other day, he released his own list of nine key pieces of evidence that was left out of this trial that would perhaps sway you the other way when you uh, when you watch it. And I will say that some of those do have to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, to me, there's a lot of questions about whether or not he did it, but I can tell you that there's no question in my mind that there was manipulation at the minimum of the evidence in this thing. And it, 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 any way you want to slice it, it's scary to think that that this type of thing can still happen because, like the the lawyers at the end say, doesn't matter if you believe in his innocence or guilt or whatever. When you see this and you realize that it's not until you're in the middle of this that you go, "Wow, this is a this is this, there's no way out of this." And, and I mean, it is amazing. Again, uh, no matter whether whatever you want, go watch it. You'll enjoy. It. By the way, it's a heck of a way to blow through a weekend. Anyway, it's called Making a Murderer. It's on Netflix. But after you watch it, make sure you go out and do your own. Uh, research into this thing because they obviously um, only presented a a side that was more favorable to the defense. Although I thought they were much more fair to both sides of the story than they than a lot of documentaries were, but they were still very much leaning towards uh, towards the one side because of course it's a better story and they followed it for ten years. So this isn't a shoddily put together thing. This is a a broad picture, but they had cameras rolling from day one. It's it's very interesting. You've got to go check it. Out. It's pretty good. It's called Making a Murder. Anyways, I just rolled on for the first uh, 10 minutes of the segment here about that, you guys. I'm Charles in the chat room throwing jokes at me. The Cleveland Browns murdering the best fan base in the NFL. <laughs> Cleveland Browns, the murder of a quarterback. Oh, man, you could go on and on with that. Cleveland Browns are in the middle of their coaching search. We're going to talk about that with Dan Wismar in a minute. We'll get into all of that, and uh, and, and let's do that. But first, I want to go to the phones, and I want to go to one of you guys. I've been drone and on and on here for a minute. Let's put you guys on the phone, on the mouthpiece of the show. Caller, kick us off on the Sports Fix. Who's this? My friend, how are you? I'm good. Who's this? Is this Mayor Vic? It sure is. How are you, Michael? I'm friend? great. How are you doing, my man? I haven't heard from you in a while. Well, I've been busy, busy doing a lot of different things nowadays. So, Absolutely. Uh, I know you took a run at the, at the office again, and you've had a lot of it, stuff going on. Yeah, I'm uh, now... Doing a blog, I'm the I'm the vice I'm the vice president of and here's a cheap little plug, NordoniaHills.news. I'm the vice president of that now and oh, uh, good stuff. Get, getting back into the photography as I used to do with the Cavaliers and Belkin back in the day and writing and reporting and having a ball at it. Well, that sounds pretty cool, man. While you're reporting stuff, can you do you, do you have the scoop? Is is Stephen Avery guilty or what, my man? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely, just, just. Yeah. Did you watch that? I, I know I just droned yes, on I about did. it. So. Yes, I did. But, what did you think of uh, it, though? They definitely present a case that even if you think he's guilty, you go, man, they didn't have the right evidence, so they made sure that they got this guy the second time. You know, though, it's, it's so nice now. I don't have to be politically correct anymore. You can't really trust the government, and and I can now I can now say that that I'm not part of it. But you know something. Slowly but surely, every day we're losing more and more of our rights. I mean, it's really, oh, yeah. I mean, it's really sad. It it truly is sad. They can go into your bank. They can go into your telephone account. They can go into your computer. They can hack anything they want to hack. I mean, it's rather, rather, rather sad. I mean, someone was telling me the other day that Russia almost has as much as many rights as as Americans anymore. Now, I think that's kind of a reach, but uh, you know what? That's a, that's another story, though, for another time. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's up, my man? Uh, How are you feeling today? I, Where are you at? I'm feeling great, but you know something? Had I called you a couple of weeks ago, I would have been popping nitro pill after nitro pill. You know, how can any coach worth, worth any value come here when... Sashi Sushi Brown, some attorney, <laughs> some baseball geek, and the owner's wife is going to tell you who to pick, where to play them, how to play them. What coach is going to put up with that nonsense? 
Well, I mean, it goes without saying, and we've talked about this quite a bit. I mean, you're not going to get a certain pedigree of coach here because of all of those reasons. Not to, that's exactly. without even touching the the Browns' recent history itself. Just those reasons there, which is why, as we see the first week, and I was going to get into that here when Dan joins me in a minute, as you see the first week of coaching candidates come. What's funny is uh, every one of them hits Cleveland and then hits San Francisco five minutes later, and all of a sudden the rumors are that they're they're closing in on a deal here. That's what you're going to hear, and I just want Browns fans to understand that. You're going to hear Hugh Jackson comes into Cleveland to interviews and then gets hired by San Francisco. You're going to hear they Adam Gaze comes into Cleveland, gets interviewed, do. and then signs right. with the Miami Dolphins. You're going to exactly. hear all the coaches that you want are going to – and that's fine because you knew that that was going to happen. My hope is whichever coordinator that the Browns end up with. Although, I will say this, I got some hope, even though I don't have a bright flame. My man's back in the coaching search range. It just happens that he's been uh, available the last, well, the Browns look for a coach every year. So that's why this guy's been available a couple times. But Lovey Smith is the one name that I'm going to throw out there that I say, man, if I was the Browns and I wipe out on these guys that I'm trying for, I would make a hard push for a guy like that. But Lovey Smith, I don't think would do it. But then again, the way he left Tampa Bay, I got a feeling that he is going to be highly motivated to do something else in the NFL, maybe not have to necessarily take a year off. But besides him, there's not going to be a bona fide candidate. And a matter of fact, I'll say this, I think a dark horse, and I don't think this is likely, but if the Browns literally didn't get anybody that they actually wanted in the searches and we get a situation like we did when they hired Mike Pettin, I could see John Filippo getting the, 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 the bump up to becoming a head coach, and and they could use that as an argument for main. I could totally see the discussion that hey, after we interviewed everybody, we realized that we had the best guy right here in house the whole time, and so because they did keep him, they announced that he is one of the few coaches that they are going to retain. So he will at least be the offensive coordinator next next season. But keep that in mind because we're going to be looking at coordinators, Vic. You're positive of that. So my only hope is that the one that you get is able to to grow into the job. I'm really kind of leaning to I like Sean McDermott. I, I like the thought of that. I know some people don't want anything to do with another defensive guy, but then the same guy the next day will go, hey, I want Matt Patricia. Like, well, I'm pretty sure he coaches on the defensive side of the ball too. But uh, I, I don't care necessarily what side of the ball they're on. I just care that uh, they're not – uh, crap at their job like most of the that level of candidates and that's where the trick comes in because that's the level of candidates the Browns are going to be at. Well the b- problem here and is again the same thing and, and and as you alluded to the Browns with Patton he was what their fifth, sixth, maybe seventh pick. Oh yeah, Every, at least fifth. He was at least the ev- fifth choice. Yeah. Everybody else of any merit, of any quality is going to take a look at this this mess, zoo, debacle, whatever term you want to put to it, and say, let me see, we got a baseball geek, we got an attorney, and we got the owner's wife, and we got some some ex-assistant coach, Jed or Judd or Uncle Jed, whatever the hell his name is. Oh, Jed Hughes. Yeah. What the hell? You know, you know something? Common sense. And then you're then telling your new coach, by the way, we don't have a general manager yet, so... Uh, we don't know if you're going to be copacetic with him. See, and who that's, the hell's who the I'm, hell's going to walk into that type well, of situation? Well, and I'm with you. We already know that about the the coaching. I, I mean, to me, that that's a, a given. But what you just described, think about that. That convoluted structure is what we've talked to. I'm sure Dan and I will get back into it when he jumps on here in the next segment. But the whole when you dump Chud and Banner and Lombardi, you said. It was too convoluted, and we've got to streamline it, which made a whole lot of sense because you wanted to make it real simple. General manager answers to the owner. Coach answers to the general manager. Everybody answers. You know, everybody knows their job. And then apparently that 
felt that that wasn't streamlined enough. So they said, now we need to complicate it more. And as you said, now you've got uh, a group of people trying to choose a coach who is going to settle on a job where he has no real roster control or say so in player personnel. And he's not exactly sure who the player personnel person is going to be because that person doesn't exist yet. So it does. It, it comes down to what it is. And listen, guys, if you're a Browns fan, you don't want to hear this. I understand. But the Browns for the next is. week are going to be the stop that every coach makes to guarantee they get a fair contract offer from their their next interview after they leave the Browns. Because as long as you stop an interview in Cleveland, they know you can take that job. They know that you can take that opportunity. So you stop in Cleveland, you interview, you go to the next place, and they say, well, if we leave here without a deal, we're going to go back to Cleveland. And then they get their contract, and that's what's going to happen. You'll you see six or seven coaches go through exactly. Cleveland land somewhere else, and then the Browns will have the seventh or eighth choice. And that's why I hold out hope. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to get myself excited. But I hold out hope that a guy like Lovey Smith was so ticked off at the way he was called on the phone. I mean, it was really disrespectful, I think, what they did to Lovey Smith in Tampa Bay, especially when you look at the crap product that they gave him to work with on the field. And Lovey Smith is a hell of a coach. I don't care what anybody says. My hope is that maybe he's mad enough to go, I want to take a job that's even worse than Tampa Bay and prove that that that, that is not the way I want to end things. And I could be wrong. He could be like, hey, send me my paycheck and I'm going to go home and, and forget football for a year. But that's my only hope for the Browns to get a legitimate coach would be a situation like that. And that would just be luck for that to work out for the Browns. And guess what? We've never been very lucky here with the no, Browns. And, yeah, and, so. and, now, and now they're saying that the Bengals are going to get rid of Marvin Lewis. You know, Hey, you know, I would take Marvin Lewis right now. I don't I know about you, Marvin Vic. Lewis in a New York minute. I don't care if he loses every there. playoff game. I haven't seen a playoff game. At I want... least he gets them there. Exactly. Them I want... there. I'll take Andy Dalton we and don't even Marvin sniff Lewis. The playoffs. We don't even sniff the damn playoffs. I know. Trust Three, me. Three, four if... games a year. No, 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 no. I had a you dream. A couple weeks ago, Vic, and I talked about it on the show, that Marvin Lewis got canned and he did the reverse Paul Brown. He went from Cincinnati up to Cleveland and and righted the ship up here. Although, although, in all fairness, there's no way Marvin Lewis would have had the same career in Cleveland that he was able to have in Cincinnati because they were ready to fire him every year or two down in Cincinnati. Uh, Here... That would have happened because the media, the fans, it, the way they're so reactionary here. Do, could you seriously imagine every off season the way they've done it in Cincinnati with Marvin Lewis? Could you? There's no way Marvin Lewis would survive all of that here, man. So you he would have never. I, I I can't fathom how Haslam thinks that what he has set up, and now I know the new coach. The new coach won't even have a say as to his offensive coordinator. He's 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 now tied himself with with this other guy who's going to be retained. So you don't have a general manager. Well, here's the thing, though, and, you know. and you got to look at it this way. And now I'm going to be fair to the Browns. I'm going to be fair to the Browns here, which is more than they are to the fan base most of the time. And that is, if I'm Paul D. Podesta. I already know all of this stuff. I already know that I can't hire a coach that's truly a game changer. There's not a chance. No matter how much money I offer, no matter what, I know that there's no way. So, in all honesty, I think that's why, and this is being fair to the Browns, I think that's why they set things up the way they did. Because for the next two or three years, I don't think Jimmy Haslam and Paul D. Podesta, and I'm even going to throw Haslam out, I don't think D. Podesta necessarily cares who his head coach is for the next two or three years. I think that he has... He wants to put his – if you've read Moneyball, the way he did with baseball, he wants to figure out his system, put it into place, start getting the drafting of his players and the type of players that the organization wants. And to be totally fair, they know they're only going to win three, four, five games the next couple. I don't think they care – 
who the name is of the next head coach as long as he's willing to buy into the analytics because that's going to be the key is he's got to be willing to play the guys that they draft and all that. So I honestly think that the Browns aren't as stupid as as everybody is making it sound as far as this goes. I think they know that they could literally hold out Fort Knox and not get very good coaching candidates to come in here. So I think they've already said, hey, our job, our goal is to entice the next head coach to come here. Let's spend the next two or three years making this a place where we can get the coach that we want. Let's just get a guy in here to kind of hold the ship down while we start to redraft and we rebuild this roster because they're going to toss everybody. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of this training camp, there's nobody left from three years ago barely anybody left from two years ago, and a year from now there'll be nobody left from last year. They're going to wipe the you know, whole slate clean. You know something, all of, all of these people, and, and I and I read some of your posts, and you and I both agree, Joe Thomas and All-Pro this past year, that's a joke. That's a joke. Joe Thomas got is, is a shell of what he used to be. The only way he got plaudits this year was because he's what he's done in the past. Alex Mack... And an all-pro or pro bowler, that's another joke. You know, even though these are holes that we would have to See, fill I disagree eventually. on Joe Thomas with you guys. I, I, I hear you about Alex Mack. Alex Mack, to me, took a big step back this year and proved that he's much less what, what he sold himself to be when he got the big franchise contract. He's much more what I thought he was before that, which is a good center but not necessarily the best in the NFL. Joe Thomas, I disagree with you, and, and I can do the advanced stats with you and tell you that they don't bear out what you say. Everybody loves to say, oh, he's been slipping, and last year he got penalized 80 times, and then when I go look it up, it was six. And same this year. I know some people are tired of Joe Thomas being here in Cleveland. I'm not one of them, and I disagree. But I do agree with you about Alex Mack. I do. How he made the Pro Bowl, I have no idea. We don't have anything better to replace him with. So, you know what? Uh, You know, you really don't have a choice. But, you know, you know what bothers me is, again, this this number one pick, Irving, you talk about Gilbert being a bust, which he is. What about Irving? He's... He's just as big of a bust. Well, first off, I am big on not using that word after one season on anybody, including Johnny Manziel. Even he had to get a second season to see what he could do because so many players make their biggest improvements between years one and two and years two and three. So I'm not going to – but as we've seen, Brother Ray wasn't exactly the best uh, drafting guy over here anyway, although – that has yet to bear itself out because they always say you got to wait a couple of years for a draft class. I think this guy is going to be known for busting out all of his upper picks. I do believe that. But I think he'll hit a few that will be remembered. But everybody does. When you get a few right in the middle, I'm not a Ray Farmer fan at all. He was awful in the draft. I'm not going to give up on Irving just because he had an awful season. That being said, he ain't walking into the NFL the, the the instant starter that they sold him as when they drafted him either. Justin Gilbert, that's different. I mean, they drafted that guy without ever talking to him first. And, I mean, that to me sums everything up. But I don't think we can even talk about the draft picks anymore because they're literally all going to be gone. They, this entire roster will not be here two years from now minus – maybe eight or ten core players. You can mark that down. They did the same thing two years ago. All of these guys will be somewhere else in two years. That's just the way you it know, works. You know, but Jay Rock, how do you explain the most expensive defense in the entire NFL and it ends up almost the worst defense in the NFL? You know, here here again goes to prove you can throw money at a problem, but if it's not if it's not properly properly you know you know put out there but you know what you're just doing that you're throwing money away but let me jump in there too i i i'll say this and look man the defense stunk and everybody's gone now and so i'm not trying to save anybody's jobs i like mike Pettin way more than you did but jim o'neill stunk doesn't matter those are football players on the field and no matter what the scheme is that your coaches are putting you in those guys couldn't make tackles they couldn't cover receivers they couldn't do their jobs. That's not the coach's fault. Those guys stunk on defense this year. If Dante Whitner would have missed any more ankle tackles this season, I swear. (laughs) And that's not 
to to try to take a cheap shot at these guys. Jim O'Neill's defense failed. He failed as a defensive coordinator. That being said, his defense failed him as well because when you're if you're making tackles, if you're making all the plays and your guys are constantly just in the wrong position, then you could say, man, these coaches are just totally coaching wrong. But when you're doing everything wrong on the field and you're out of position, it means, yes, the coach has got to go, but so do some of these players. And I think that, that that's what you saw is a combination of that. And you get some guys that try and go rogue and do their own thing. Yeah, it reminds me of Sean Rogers, and I've got to wrap this up after that. But I remember... This was when I was first getting into the radio business. I was a, a fan of Sean Rogers. I thought, man, this guy was one of the, he's huge, but he could dunk a basketball, and he had all this athleticism, and he was like the only good defensive lineman the Browns had. And then I was talking one day with uh, with Bubba Baker, and we were talking about something, and he came up, and I uh, Bubba schooled me real quick on why uh, Sean Rogers has is awful. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like he's like. And and I learned, and I talked to several other players who told me the same thing. In their opinion, Sean Rogers was a coach killer, was a defense killer, because no matter what the play was called, he was only worried about getting to the quarterback and getting a sack and getting a statistic. So even if the play called for him to take two blockers out of the way so the linebacker could make the tackle, he didn't do that. He went after the quarterback and he exposed a running lane and the Browns' defense would get gashed. So the fans would only see... Sean Rogers get a sack every game or whatever, get a big tackle in the backfield. They didn't realize that he was hanging his teammates out to dry on three out of every four plays because he was going rogue and doing his own thing. A great athletic specimen, great, great one-on-one player, but the way he was playing was actually a huge detriment to the Browns' defense. But the casual fan would go, man, Sean Rogers is the only good one on this defense when actually... He was hurting the defense and making himself look good in the process, which when I heard that and I said, man, that's something that you you learn to look at the game a little bit of a different way. And I think you had some of that here. You had guys miscast in the wrong scheme. You definitely had a bad coach. I mean, Jim O'Neill was an awful defensive coordinator, and I didn't like the defenses in Buffalo. I thought all they could do was get sacks and turnovers, but they gave up the worst rushing yardage in the game, and they weren't that great against the pass. Either way, he's gone. Doesn't matter now, and all these players are going to be gone too. Mayor Vic, my man, anything else before we go? The only thing I can say is this. You know, you know something? It's a sad commentary, but Haslam, once again, will have 72,000 people every game. He'll yep. sell out the season. Hey! And, you saw the you and, saw the numbers, Vic, right? The yeah. Bengals and the Steelers both played each other this past weekend in the playoffs, and the Browns outdrew both of those teams at home in attendance this season. If that makes any sense, the Browns outdrew them both. We, I mean, we have such a loyal fan base, and you know check what? This out. And I have written this. I've, I've written this ad nauseum. I feel sorry for these people. It's like they continually drink out of the Kool-Aid bin. Well, and you know what? They, and they love to tailgate. They will go down there and sit in inclement weather and, and, and eat that overpriced food. Pay the $20 in parking, you know, week in, week out. And, they, and they're unfortunately treated to garbage. Garbage on the field. Check Haslam, this out. My buddy Haslam Ray had better... Haslam had better... You know, one of these days, these people are going to say, why am I spending two, $3,000 a year to watch garbage? I know. I know. I know. Check this out. As we wrap this up, I was talking to my buddy, actually, about this the other day, Ray Rowe. Um, he is one half of the World Tag Team Champions we're in Ring of Honor Wrestling right now. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, we were talking about this, and he said... Uh, um, he said, why would ownership ever invest in improving this product? Because it's a bad business move. If you're looking at the Browns as a business owner, it's a bad business move to invest because they're already making so much money. He said, in any other business, we're not calling him a con man. We're calling him a genius. We're calling him a great businessman. We're calling him a man who is able to reap huge rewards with small amounts of investment yet in football. And and, and it, it, he went on to joke. He said, I don't know why people are shocked that he saw the benefit in buying an asset that is practically unsinkable. And and but he he harshly makes a good point. Um 
it's actually a bad business move to to worry about whether the Browns are better. You try, but you don't lose sleep over it because of exactly what we just said. It doesn't mean you don't try. People can't confuse the two. The Browns are like a casino. I don't want to name any anything. The Browns are like a casino. They print money. Right. I mean, that's my thing. Is I'm not going to say that the Browns don't try to improve because they do, but they don't lose sleep when they don't because they're still going to get paid. So, Mayor Vic, I got to go, my man. Great okay, talking buddy. to you. Okay, have a great one. You got it. It's been a while. My man, the former mayor of Northfield, Big Vic. Good call, you guys. Keep the calls rolling in later. We'll reopen the phones. Coming up next, let's get some news in and Dan Wismar in on the conversation. And we'll talk about the Browns coaching search. We'll talk NFL playoffs. Exciting round. All the road teams won this weekend. A couple of last-minute ones, that's for sure. We'll get into all of that. Cavaliers on a roll. But they've got some tests coming up. A week from today, the the final one of those comes back to the queue with the Warriors. We'll talk about all of that national title game and football and more when Dan Wismar joins us next from Everybody Hates Cleveland. Going to be a lot of fun, as it always is, coming up next after the news here on the Sports Fix. Before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio. You can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd when it comes to cleveland sports we go from i can't touch this to i can't watch this so listen to the fix it's easier on the eyes Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go fish that! Oh, come on! (laughs) This is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24-7 at the Sports Fix CLE. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. Real Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. Portions of the sports fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit fantasyjocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. 
Good morning, I'm Bob Picozzi. It will be the 16th time the two schools have met, but the first time in the postseason. Clemson meets Alabama tonight in Glendale, Arizona in the College Football Playoff Championship game. 8.30 Eastern time on ESPN TV, 7 o'clock on ESPN Radio. Clemson coach Dabo Sweeney played at Alabama and was an assistant coach there. Notre Dame coach Brian Kelly, a guest this morning on Mike and Mike. Dabo has got a great personality, and it's infectious, and it's part of what they built there. So I think personalities have a lot to do with how your team plays and how they can play effectively. Um, You know, at times, Clemson plays that way. Sweeney's Tigers have won 56 games in the last five years. The Chiefs should learn more today about the status of wide receiver Jeremy Macklin, who left Saturday's wildcard playoff win over Houston. ESPN's Adam Schefter reporting it's a high ankle sprain. Kentucky coach John Calipari tweeted this morning, he's not negotiating with any team and plans to be at Kentucky for a long time. His name has already been mentioned as a possible successor to Brooklyn Nets coach Lionel Hollins, who was fired yesterday. The only thing worse than sitting in traffic is all of the wear and tear your engine experiences from the constant stop and go. So do your engine a favor. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics, made from natural gas and designed for complete protection. Pennzoil Synthetics are pure performance. Now, back to the Sports Fix. Your choice for intelligent talk. Hopefully you're grooving with us right now here on the Sports Fix. Welcome in no matter what day or time or night or whatever it is. Thank you guys for being with us here. J-Rock back with you. We are live on a Monday. Dan Wismar is on the hotline. Going to join us in just a moment as we get back into the groove. No pun intended. If you guys want to roll with us, keep the conversation going. On Facebook, on Twitter, on email, you can call the hotline. Leave your take there, 216-539-7535. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Twitter at The Sports Fix, C-L-E. Email us, The Sports Fix at AOL.com. I got more people wanting to interact with me in the first hour on social media about making a murderer than the Browns head coaching search. I think everybody's resigned themselves to the fact that the Browns are just guilty as charged as far as getting uh, a head coaching candidate that they're not going to be that happy with. But uh, much more people back and forth about whether or not old Stephen Avery is guilty. I'm telling you, it's worth your time. It is the it is the it's the proof. It's the binge. It's whatever that is, man. That's the Netflix knows what they're doing. That's a a hole that I fell into for sure. It was a lot of fun, though. Keep it going, guys. Facebook, Twitter, email thesportsfix at AOL.com. Tweet with me at thesportsfixcle. I'm going to go to the phones and get Dan in on the conversation. We'll pick back up, talk a little bit more about the Browns head coaching search as we roll into week number two and continue to uh, watch that. NFL playoffs over the weekend. A lot to get into there and more. Let's do it. Cavs are rolling, too. I want to talk some Cavs hoops. Dan Wismar, my man. How you doing, buddy? I am doing great, J-Rock. Good to be back with you. Absolutely. Good to have you here. How was your weekend? Uh, it was It was good. I, uh, you know, a little under the weather in my household, uh, my wife and I both, but uh, we, uh, it didn't stop us from, of course, uh, taking in all of the NFL playoff action. I got to say, after the uh, after the New Year's uh, Six Bowl games turned out to be a little bit of a disappointment. I I got to say that so too did Wild Card Weekend. I, I uh, the first game, of course, was a real dog, uh, uh, and as uh, Brian Hoyer uh, circled the drain, that was that was unfortunate for him. Uh, but it just adds another name to the list of teams that are still looking for that franchise quarterback. Uh, you know, the Seeler game, of course, was half of a dog game, and then it got very interesting, uh, you know, later on in the uh, in the contest and obviously ended up being very exciting down the stretch. Uh, of course, the story of the game was the the unraveling uh, of the Bengals and uh, and all the finger-pointing and everything that went on after that. And I got to say, I was pulling for the Bengals. I hate them a little slightly less than I hate the Steelers. And and uh, so, so that, was, uh, that was something, although, you know, uh, getting harder and harder to hate the Steelers with all those Buckeyes on their team. They start three of them on defense, but um, that, that's you know don't don't worry. I still hate the Steelers. 
But uh, anyway, uh, Saturday's games I thought were a little bit disappointing. Uh, Sunday's games I thought pointed up what we've been talking about recently, how the NFC is really just a superior conference this year at least. And uh, it just seems the teams there are, are better, and we haven't even seen the two best NFC teams yet. Yeah, definitely, especially at least through the, uh, the lower-seeded teams that we saw here on the first weekend. I would agree with that there. You talked about the Steelers game. I guess start there with the Steelers, Bengals, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, what the hell was Joey Porter allowed on the field for at the end of the Joey Porter, man, I'll tell you, that's somebody that uh, over the years, man, he falls right into line with a lot of those Steelers players that many people, not just here, but have issues with. I saw some, uh, as a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, uh, one of the one of the Bengals players was talking to the media and talked about how uh, after the game uh, he said I hugged Mike Tomlin and uh, it was Andrew Whitworth said I hugged Mike Tomlin and apologized for the way we played the game have a lot of respect for the Steelers Joey Porter not one of them before the last game he's at midfield mother effing everybody on the field and he said uh, none of what else he went on to say was good about Joey Porter in this little uh, thing but uh, how how does that happen I, uh, several of those things I mean. Do you think that uh, what should have happened as far as the hits at the end of that game? What, what were your thoughts on some of the controversial spots there? Well, first of all, I, I think in terms of helmet to helmet hits, uh, first of all, there's no debate about the uh, about the perfect hit. No, uh, it was idiotic. It was late. It was vicious. Uh, it was unnecessary and uncalled for. Uh, but so was the Ryan Shazier hit a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, when, when he closes on that receiver and goes hat to hat with him and puts him down, uh, I thought that should have been at the very least a 15 yard penalty too. So it was inconsistently done. Uh, I thought it was interesting, of course, and the Bengals fans, I follow a lot of Bengals fans on Twitter. A lot of the Buckeye beat writers and guys like that are, are, are Bengals rooters. And, and, uh, there was really no defense for what perfect did. Uh, there was, maybe a slightly better defense for what Pac-Man Jones did because, because like you say, Joey Porter had no business being on the field. He wasn't even the assistant coach responsible for Antonio Brown's position group. Uh, you know, Antonio Brown, of course, down on the field at the time uh, from the Bertha kit. Uh, but Adam Jones, Pac-Man Jones, goes up and basically shoves Joey Porter in the chest, gets the 15-yard penalty, the second consecutive one. People saying, you know, Ben Roethlisberger, he's a magician. He gets 30 yards uh, by throwing an incomplete pass, yep. which is really effectively what happened. I thought it was interesting that the three people most responsible for the Bengals unraveling were the three people, and I'm including Jeremy Hill, who fumbled on first down after the interception. Yep. Uh, add to that Pac-Man Jones and, and Burfick then, who were the three quote-unquote bad actors uh, or, or at least the guys that had questionable character concerns. The reason that 32 teams passed on Burfecht in the draft, uh, and 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 immediately, of course, uh, Myron Lewis coming in for criticism for employing these guys at all, when basically the other 30 some teams in the NFL had declined to do yep. so. Um, you know, maybe coincidental, maybe not so much. Maybe character, uh, you know. Uh, uh, they say what that uh, tough times don't uh, develop character; they reveal it. You know, uh, uh, you know. In, in crunch time, the guys who had their character questioned coming into the league, and since then, uh, are the guys that screwed it up for their team when the pressure was on. Um, I don't know how much stock you can put in that. I'm not ready to hang these guys out to dry as uh, as the as you know the guys that carry all the blame for Cincinnati coming unglued. But there's little doubt that Cincinnati flat out came unglued, yeah. and uh, and Marvin Lewis ultimately is responsible for that. But but uh, you know Hill, Jones, Perfect, they the three of them three consecutive you know blunders in the clutch when they had that game won. You know minute 36 to go, you pick off the ball, you've got a first down inside the Steeler 30 with a lead. Right. Uh, you know crazy. Uh, I and, and again I gotta say Ben Roethlisberger is a wizard. He, he's a witch. Uh, you know, here, here, he's, not, he's been knocked out of the game, Jerry. He's been knocked out I know, of the game. I know. And, 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 you know, a minute 20 to go, no timeouts. Uh, or, I'm sorry, he did have all three of his timeouts, I should say. Uh, when, when he finally took the ball, the only thing that saved the Steelers, they had declined to use any of their timeouts prior to that. And, and uh, Ben definitely needed them as he worked his team down the field. And, of course, 
took advantage of 30 yards and in, in penalties. But I, I believe that with I think it was 18 seconds to go, Jerry, when when this uh, this stuff all happened, and they were close to midfield. He needed to get another 15 yards in 18 seconds. I have no doubt that even if the penalties hadn't happened, Ben Roethlisberger is going to get his team in position for a field goal uh, to potentially win that game. So. Uh, you can't necessarily say that were it not for the penalties, the Bengals would have won because it's just simply not true. Ben had 18 seconds to go uh, and, and could have used them. So uh, crazy ending. I was obviously pulling for the Bengals, and of course everybody uh, in our local world was saying, "Boy, the Bengals really browned that one up." Um, and uh, you know, you, you have to understand the sentiment. We, we can relate to what the Bengals did uh, because we've, uh, you know fresh in our memories is the uh, the block punt return for a touch or block field goal return for a touchdown uh, <laughs> yeah. against the Ravens and other crazy ways to uh, to lose football games. So uh, that was the the highlight of the night, obviously, and uh, not a very good one if you're a Steelers hater. No, I've never been a, a Pac-Man Jones guy, all the off-the-field stuff involving him. And perfect, whatever, I can't remember what it was. He had some big deal earlier in the season. He's just a thug, and there's I have no love for him. But I remember saying, and I can't remember, it wasn't like a big deal. It's not like it was some, uh, you know, uh, a Nostradamus moment. But I remember saying, man, uh, that's the kind of guy that when the chips are down, uh, he'll hurt you more than he'll help you. And boy, man, when I saw that, this I said, that's what I mean. I, I just I got no love for that guy at all. And uh, uh, the Steelers well, to me, the, I'm I, not trying I to. Saw, oh, go ahead. I, I'm just going to say what I saw immediately after the game was a, a vine that somebody put out of a shot that the Berkley put on uh, the Ravens tight end Max Williams uh, early in the season. Might even have just been their their game a couple of weeks ago. That might be the one uh, I'm talking a, about. A vicious, a vicious yeah. helmet to helmet shot that just laid him out. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't even know for sure whether there was a flag on it. I was just seeing a, a six second vine. He's a dirty player. He... And, and, uh, it was just a, it was just a flat out dirty play, and, and that's the way the guy plays the game. So yes. Uh, however, I will say this, and I don't know what news there might be out there this morning, but the people that I read and know and trust, and I'll include one, Marcus Hartman, a friend of mine who, who's a Buckeye beat writer, grew up in Southeast Ohio, uh, Southwest Ohio, I should say, not in Cincinnati, but nearby is a Bengals guy and, and, and knows the Bengals organization. He says there's no way Marvin Lewis gets fired over this. Good. Good. Uh, you know, Marvin Lewis is uh, has weathered bigger storms than this. Uh, and despite his record in playoff games, uh, he's, uh, he's not going anywhere. According to people that really follow the team and understand the thinking of Mike Brown and his, and his organization, uh, they don't think that Marvin Lewis is going anywhere based on this. So just... Uh, I, I, you know, a couple guys whose opinions I respect uh, are saying no way does he lose his job over this. I wouldn't think so. I want him to come up north myself, but, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, uh, uh, over in New York. It wasn't until they finally said, okay, we're finally going to make this move. You know, that situation with Coughlin, a lot like um, – Marvin Lewis, every year it seems like those guys have to wait to find out if they're going to stick around. And then next thing you know, they've been there for 15 years or however long it's been. But you got to think that wears on you after a while. If you're, if you're, if you're Marvin Lewis, that's got to wear on you after a while constantly. I know it's part of the job, but constantly having to defend your position and, and wonder if, if you're still going to be there and, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. But anyways. Uh, as, as it stands, I think he might be the second longest tenured head coach in the NFL. For sure. Uh, yeah. Behind Bel- behind Belichick, I believe. He's been there, I think, 13 years. Yeah, he's got to so, be number two. Uh, and and with, his, with his playoff record, he's obviously suffered the, uh, the slings and arrows of uh, popular opinion. Yes. Uh, and I, I don't know, frankly, what, what the majority of the Cincinnati Bengals fan base is thinking or saying uh, uh, after this weekend, but... Uh, uh, he's an institution there after uh, more than a decade as a head coach, and uh, certainly the playoff record would get a lot of coaches fired, uh, but uh, Cincinnati organization's always been a little bit of a different bird. And that, to me, would be one of those, uh, be careful what you wish for, and then after you get it, you might go, boy, the grass wasn't, wasn't so bad when Marvin was mowing it. All of a sudden, we, uh, you know, that's how it goes. So I, it'll be interesting to see, uh, but I, I'm with you. I can't see them making that move, but 
Well, we'll see, man. And then, you know, switch over. And by the way, Pittsburgh to me is toast. Uh, they, I hate, I don't like saying somebody lost and somebody didn't win, but Cincinnati lost that game, in my opinion. Pittsburgh was playing anybody that doesn't uh, collapse down the stretch. I don't think they make it out. And I don't think they survive next weekend. Uh, I think you saw, I'll tell you, Kansas City to me is the question mark over there because they feasted on Houston, but Houston just absolutely melted down, as did my boy Brian Hoyer. So uh, that defense is for real, but uh, I don't, I don't put no stock in Pittsburgh uh, when you head into next weekend. Go over to the to the other side. And by the way, how about the road teams across the uh, across the board there um, throughout the weekend? Although the, the the two played out the way most people saw it, not not necessarily on the scoreboard. How about the Seahawks and Minnesota? Not only does that game come down to the very end, but I think I saw it before the game. I want to say Seattle was only the third team in NFL history to win a playoff game being scoreless through three quarters, and uh, they did. They, they were the third team to do that. But what a game there. And talk about fortunate Seattle, to me, fortunate to still be playing some football here. I was joking with my son last night. I said, boy, they may they may go to the Super Bowl off of this because they, you know, that's one of those ones where you look back and go, man, they were a missed field goal away from being out, and then they make the run. But uh, what an end of that game for uh, for both teams. Yeah, it was crazy, Jerry. And, of course, I was rooting for Minnesota. My son-in-law is from Minneapolis. Uh, he's a huge Vikings fan, and so I was kind of agonizing with him for him. I wanted Minnesota, uh, during, too. During, just... during that game. Yeah. And uh, the Vikings have been done, been such a pleasant surprise this year, and I think Zimmer coach of the year in the NFL. I've said Gotta that be. before. Got to um, be. But, uh, you know, what a gut-wrencher. And, and uh, you know, again, we Browns fans, you know, we can relate, you know. Even even Browns fans think, hey, that's a tough way to lose a football game. Uh, but uh, you know, you go back to 1980 and and uh, you know, right right 88, where a short field goal would have won it for you. You didn't even get a chance to to, to kick it. But um, yeah, just a just a heartbreaker and uh, tough tough way to lose a game. And and yeah, Seattle's got to be counting their blessings and uh, they're. They're rugged. I mean, Minnesota had multiple chances to score, and they ended up settling for, what, three field goals when they had really very, very good red zone opportunities yeah. to score touchdowns. Couldn't couldn't make it happen, and obviously that's what cost them in the end. But, uh, yeah, boy, like you say, brutal, brutal, brutal way to lose a football game and like that. Very brutal. Very brutal way, man. Especially when you when you make one that's twice as long earlier in the in the uh, in the game, and then to uh, yeah. what was it? What was it twenty twenty seven yards? What was that? The, the I think final? it was twenty seven. Yeah, they yeah. Were, they was, I mean, it was chip shot. It was shorter shorter than an extra point. Right, um, right. Uh, I know, and and so just just uh, just terrible. And one thing I wanted to mention to you, and I think one thing that this weekend pointed out. Granted, you've got several franchises. Uh, in and out of the playoffs that, that finished the season uh, with backup quarterbacks. <laughs> Excuse me. But it, it really points up how lousy and mediocre is too strong a word uh, the quarterback play is in the NFL right now. Uh, yes, four road teams won playoff games, but it also was four teams that had quarterbacks who had started in the playoffs before versus four teams that didn't have a quarterback who had ever started in the playoffs before. And and that's not a coincidence. More nope. important a factor probably than the fact that four teams were on the road and the other four teams were at home. Um, there may there might be 13 to 15 teams in the NFL today that have even adequate starting quarterback play, let alone backup quarterback play. It really is getting tougher and tougher to find, develop, and and keep healthy, uh, competent quarterbacks in this league. And I think it's a real problem for the league uh, that the the game has become so quarterback centric. And still, probably at least half the teams in the league are uh, playing uh, on you know overemployed people in the job. You know why and, though. Uh, I think a lot of that that you just said is because of, and we've witnessed it firsthand here in Cleveland, because of the impatience, I think across the league, there is a lack of of player development anymore, and it's seen most at the quarterback position. But 
I, I think that so many people want to plug and play, or they they say develop a guy, but they think that that means give him a training camp and a couple of regular season games to watch the starter and then throw him out there and, and let him learn on the fly. I just I feel that that's a part of it because I, I find it impossible to believe that for decades the, the league continued to replenish it itself with quarterbacks and I know that the, the the games change don't get me wrong but like you the disparity the fact that there's literally a handful of good 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 quarterbacks and then everybody else the, the disparity has to come from something and I think part of it is the the lack of pay I think there's a lot of guys Alex Smith is a great example there's a lot of guys that get washed out and pushed aside and they're out of the league before they've ever been developed and if they get developed long enough they turn into not all of them obviously but the good ones turn into Alex Smith and have long productive careers as above average or better quarterbacks and I think that the the lack of that is one of the biggest reasons I mean you're only going to get so many drop from the heavens guys that come out in college the Alec, the, the Andrew Lux, the, those kind of guys, you're only going to get so many of those the rest of the good ones come from development not every great quarterback in the NFL Hall of Fame dropped from the sky like manna from heaven some of them were developed and I just think that there's a lot less of that in today's NFL Well I think you're right too and, and certainly uh, front office organizational stability has something to do with it uh, when you look at the guys that are the stars of the league at the quarterback position today, several of them, and I think off just top of my head, Brady, Roethlisberger, Breeze, to a lesser degree Aaron Rodgers, have all been with their same organizations yep. in the first three guys' cases for over a decade. And they've been starting quarterbacks in the NFL for over a decade. It's not a, it's not a head-scratcher. It's not a coincidence that those are the guys that are the best. They have the most experience. And they've also benefited from great front office stability. Roethlisberger coaches his entire career. Brady won coaches his entire Dan, career. You know who's Aaron a great Rogers, a little bit more movement than that, but uh, Breeze uh, flowered under an offensive guy. You know, Sean Payton considered an offensive genius by a lot of people uh, in this league, and and uh, he, he developed Drew Breeze. So uh, again, you just go back to, but, hey. but that is that that's four guys out of thirty-two teams, and everybody else is kind of kicking tires and trying to figure out a way to get the job done better. Hey, I think one of the one of the best examples is the guy that falls this season right underneath the four that you named as as far as the quarterback ratings and the performance on the field. Is a guy Cousins. like no, I was going to say Andy Dalton because oh yeah, right. that's a guy that first off Cincinnati fans wanted him given up on, and I definitely slept on him. I've admitted that I said, okay, this guy's nothing happening here, man. He's just an average quarterback. But by staying in place, he's gotten better and better every year. He's crept up. Whether he wins in the play, I don't want to get into all that. I mean, where he's at for his development, his career, he's put himself in that upper echelon of quarterback and. A lot of franchises would have never let him get. To, he'd have never gotten there being a, a Cleveland Browns quarterback. He, you wouldn't even know who Andy Dalton is if he had come through the Browns organization because he'd have never stayed in place long enough. And I think that switching teams to teams hurts these guys too. I mean, even a, whatever Brian Hoyer. I'm not getting into that argument, but team to team to team. Even if he continues to develop as a starter, he did some of it in New England, some of it in Cleveland, some of it in Houston, maybe goes somewhere else after that. Even that is a stutter step way to develop a quarterback because you've gone through four different coachings and systems and and all of that stuff. It's not the consistency like with a Dalton of or, or you know, Alex Smith was two organizations, but there, it's just two throughout the course of his career. San Francisco and then Kansas City. But when you've got that consistency of organization Organization too, that helps as well. Sure, and, and Alex Smith has benefited by having Andy Reid there. Uh, oh a yeah, veteran, a, a guy who has a system, who has a plan, who has a program. He's a quarterback developer, yeah, and, and a track record a quarterback yeah. developer, exactly. Uh, and so, again, no surprise that that uh, Alex Smith's career has been uh, reinvigorated by uh, by Andy Reid over hey. there. So, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was I was done there. Other than to make the comment that the Dalton in Cincinnati has also, like you say, benefited from that same kind of organizational stability that uh, that, that the other big names in this league have. Uh, not uh, not coincidental. I think if Andy Dalton comes through Cleveland through the NFL draft right now, he's lucky 
if he's a backup somewhere like a Colt McCoy. Honestly, that, that and that's the difference because by going to an organization that kept him in place, whether it was luck or plan, design, whatever, it worked. And and now he's at the top of the league as far as the, the quarterbacks around the league. So I just, I mean, that's a, 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 a blatant example. And then one of the guys you mentioned, both of the guys, I just mentioned Colt McCoy, that Packers game. I'm telling you, midway of the, through the third quarter, when Washington had the slight lead, but Green Bay was driving and getting ready to uh, – uh, score the touchdown. Uh, I, I looked at my son and I said, there's no way Washington wins this game. I don't care if they're at home. I don't care if they're winning right now. And he said, why? And I, I pointed to Aaron Rodgers. I said, that's why. I said, because he's been there. He's done that. And I guarantee you the Packers are not going to lose this game. And sure enough, they took care of business down the And their defense came up big for him as well. But uh, uh, the Packers took care of business there when they needed to. And uh, Yeah, and not only, not only their defense came up big, but what really nobody expected to happen is that their running game came through. Yeah, Cobb was uh, running down, well. Down, down down the stretch, it was Eddie Lacy, and it was uh, the other running back, Starks, uh, ran rough shot over him. Uh, Cobb, too. Cobb was coming in with some runs. Just, yeah. 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 They just decided, hey, well, you know, we can do this. And then uh, early in the game, they hadn't been doing it. And, of course, in recent weeks, as we talked last week, the Packers had not looked good and most of all not good running the football. Um, all of a sudden, they found it, and uh, you know they're they're going to be uh, forced to be reckoned with as long as uh, as long as they can run the ball because Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers. And I mean the quarterback that you pointed it out at the beginning of this little chat. I mean you look at that, you go across Rodgers playoff winner, Russell Wilson playoff winner, Ben Roethlisberger playoff winner, Alex Smith been in the playoffs. I can't remember how many he's won in the playoffs, but either way, I know it's at least one. Uh, and then you look across the board, Houston, Cincinnati, Minnesota, Washington, all quarterbacks that had either never been in the playoffs, never won in the playoffs, whatever the the case may be. So I think that's a clear example of that. And then now you kind of clear the dust a little bit. As you said, wild card weekend, not as exciting as it perhaps traditionally is, but... That being said, it sets the stage for, and we'll, we don't got to get specific, but man, there's some good games on tap this weekend. I saw the the Cardinals. They, I don't know if you just saw. I just got a little blurb came across me. Uh, Bruce Arians said this morning that they are only selling tickets exclusively to people with Arizona zip codes because if you remember, a couple of weeks ago. The Packers fans bought a ton of tickets from Cardinals fans that were selling their tickets, and they practically brought Green Bay South to uh, to Arizona, and it really ticked off uh, Bruce Arian. So they're they're literally actively checking the zip codes as people are buying the tickets, trying to prevent an exodus of uh, Packers fans to come in for that one. But I mean, all four of those games this weekend. I mean, to me, w- would you feel safe to say that's the top eight teams in football right there playing this weekend? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt, and, and uh, all you have to do is count the Super Bowl rings on the fingers of the quarterbacks. <laughs> all over. That are, that are, that are involved <laughs> in those games. They're, they're all over the place. Of course, Denver and New England have them, and uh, <clears throat> uh, even Arizona. I mean, Carson Palmer doesn't have a Super Bowl ring. Carson Palmer is a veteran, had a big year, potential MVP year this year for them. Yep. And uh, so, you know, Cam Newton, uh, you know, doesn't have one yet, but he's the other MVP candidate. So if, if you're not uh, going to finish in the top two in, in MVP voting, Newton and Carson Palmer probably, then you're sporting a, a World Series, a, a Super Bowl ring. And, and then some of the other players, including Roethlisberger, of course, uh, have their own, uh, their own rings on their fingers. So, yeah, that, it, it really does point up how crucial. And the same thing, exact thing happened last year when all the finalists uh, – you know, either had a multiple Super Bowl rings or, uh, or, or you know, significant playoff victories. Uh, quarterback play is is it, and and that's what uh, well, when when the funnel empties out, that's what you get at the end is the uh, teams that have great quarterbacks and teams that have Super Bowl experience. And look at the matchups. Okay, if you want to look at it like it's a boxing card, you look at the 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 four matchups this weekend. Alex Smith is probably the lowest man as far as accomplishments on the totem pole. You got Alex Smith versus Tom Brady. You got Aaron Rodgers versus Carson Palmer, a couple of MVP candidates. You got Russell Wilson and Cam and Newton. Manning. Yeah, and Roethlisberger and Manning. I mean, you have got the marquee quarterbacks going at it this weekend. If, the, if, if any organization needs an example of why the quarterback is so important, I mean, that's it right there. You've got the main events here, the, 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 big, the big name draws across the 
the board as far as uh, quarterbacks go in at least seven of the of the eight places here. Yeah, you know, and by the way, going back to your point about selling tickets to out of towners, um, you know, good luck to them. I don't imagine that too many uh, Arizona Cardinal uh, ticket holders are going to be unloading their tickets uh, online. But there's not a whole lot that the you know in in the day and age of, uh, of StubHub and. Yeah, and online yeah. ticket sales. There's not a whole lot the organization can do to stop that from happening. You That's know you can that, though, Dan. You know that. You know that you can actually you can geolocate your your e-commerce site to only accept orders from certain locations to not allow people to buy if they're like um like online gambling is illegal everywhere except in the states of New Jersey and uh, Nevada because they have legalized gambling there. So like the uh, the World Series of Poker uh, website, when you go to use it, if you're it geolocates you, and if you're not in the states of Nevada or New Jersey by your IP address, it will not allow you to access the the games at all. So you can geolocate. I guess technically, if they wanted to, they could make it where you would have to be in the in the in a certain location. I'm just saying, I don't think they would go that far, but you can block it out, man. Well, StubHub uh, wants your money. They don't care where you. Live. Oh, StubHub. I'm talking uh, about directly. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I got no, you. I'm, I'm talking about people. You know. The, the I'm going to say probably twenty thousand at, at least Browns ticket holders who sold their tickets to Steeler fans last weekend. Uh, you saw the terrible towels in the stadium. Oh, yeah. There were oh, yeah. there were Ugly. thousands of them. And and uh, the Buffalo Bills typically do the same thing. They bring a huge contingent down to Cleveland. Always, uh, yeah. Or yeah. Whenever they play here, and, and not a whole lot that the club or anybody else can do about that. When that's fans true. are individually putting their tickets online for sale and selling them to anybody that's going to. Yeah going to send them a check so uh that's uh again limited to what you can do but again i playoff games are different and uh games that are halfway across the country are different uh i'm sure they're uh like i said most arizona cardinals ticket holders uh probably prizing their playoff tickets like gold uh yeah and uh and plan to go to those games themselves if they're any kind of fans a bit different week 16 uh tickets and playoff tickets for sure you and i on wednesday can can really look at those games but i'm just gonna throw this out here now i i if kansas city kansas city is my dark horse man i said when the playoffs started that they were the one team that i thought wasn't new england or denver that could go to the super bowl man i said i wanted to see what they did against houston and that defense went to town if they upset New England, Kansas City's going to the I think the winner of that game is going to the Super Bowl, Kansas City and New England. And uh I'll tell you, don't mark out an upset. Can... Don't mark out an upset. Even though I'm going with the Patriots all the way. Don't mark out an upset, man. Yeah, I would agree. I think the the, the Broncos and the Steelers are both uh a little bit too beat up, uh, injured and uh, we don't even know now uh, what kind of shape Big Ben will be in or Antonio Brown will right. be in. Uh, for that game, and, and Denver's obviously got their own set of problems, uh, not least a, uh, a 39-year-old quarterback, although I, I certainly think they're making the right call to, to start Peyton Manning and uh, instead of Osweiler in that game. But, uh, yeah, I think both those teams are probably too flawed uh, and, and banged up to uh, to get to the Super Bowl. And uh, You know, again, I'm, I'm down to the point now where, uh, I don't really care. I would like, to, I would love to see Kansas City knock off New England. Uh, most of the uh, New England haters are around the country are, are, you know, with me, with me on that. But um, <clears throat> again, other than that, I don't really have uh, rooting preferences. Uh, uh, I think the Cardinals are the best team in the NFC. I'd like to see them win it, and uh, I'd like to see good things happen for Bruce Aarons. Me too. I think that that sentimentally may be my pick there. Even though, man, I still say. Man, you know what? That's why the NFC is so much stronger, like we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, because you can sit there and make a case for every single one of those four teams to be the best team, although the weakest would probably be for Green Bay because of the way they played late in the season. But at, when they're on, they're on. But, I mean, Seattle, yeah, they struggled at a point, but they got it together, and they're playing good ball even though they struggled against uh, Minnesota. Carolina, how could you see them getting knocked off? And and Arizona, I'm with you. I think Arizona is the quiet best team in the NFC. I've said that for weeks, even though Carolina had to marquee because they stayed undefeated for so long, man. And I think I want Bruce Arians. Just if, if i got to pick one, I want Arizona for that reason. And you know what? 
I didn't like Carson Palmer when he first started with the Bengals and all that, but he has stuck around and he went from being like a pretty boy, West Coast, you know, type of, you know, that kind of quarterback. You didn't know what kind of heart he had. You didn't know if he was just one of those Ken Doll type of guys. But man, he's become a lifer. He's come back from some big injuries that a lot of people would have said, okay, I had a good career. It was over. And, uh, I like I've got a lot of respect for Carson Palmer. He went through dark days, went to Oakland. I mean he he's gone through some stuff, man, and he's reemerged as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. So I think I'm pulling for Arizona, man. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I, I you gotta respect what, what Palmer has done, what he's gone through, and um again, uh credit credit Bruce Aarons for, for making that happen. Uh yeah. And, you know, they're the kind of team, long-suffering, uh, you know, no Super Bowl victories, uh, uh, ready to uh, ready to break out. And so, yeah, I just, as an uh, outside observer, uh, kind of want good things to happen for him. It's like Bruce Arians couldn't get the Browns job, and he looked around and said, well, what else is that? Well, there's another one where they haven't won in a long time. The fans are long-suffering. The team stinks on the field. Well, if I can't go to Cleveland, I'll go to the next best thing, you know. Ah, oh, what if, what if, what if? And it's just even more of a funny thing as the Browns go through their latest quarterback search, which I liken less to a quarterback search, Dan, and more to uh, a a routine in getting other assistants better contracts with their new teams because that's what the next few days is going to consist of for Browns fans. Like I was talking with Mayor Vic earlier. I said, man, what you saw over the weekend is what's going to happen. Guy stops in Cleveland, then signs with the next place. Stops in Cleveland, signs with the next place because Cleveland is the leverage to get you the contract that you need from your next stop. They've done it with Gaze and he stopped here, went to Miami. Same thing, you know, you see everybody's stopping here on their way to San Francisco. Some Somebody is going to get paid at San Francisco because they stopped in Cleveland. It is what it is. But do you agree with my last thing that I said, which was, I think the Browns already know this. And I honestly don't think they truly care what the name is of their next coach. Because I think they've resigned themselves to the fact that they're not going to get the guy that they want. And that they need a few years to put the rest of the stuff in place anyway. I think they're really looking less for a coach and more for a caretaker. Well, that may be. Um, I think that they don't care that they have limited the field. Uh, you know, had they had, you know, that they had limited the field by setting up the structure that they had and then making that structure public uh, the same day they fired the last guys. <laughs> and and you know, so they've they've obviously limited the the field of candidates that can and will consider them, and that they don't care about. That they they are resigned to, and they say, well, yes, that's just the way it is. If that limits our field of potential candidates, so be it. Um, we want someone that's going to come in and be able to get, you know, fit into this organizational structure the way we have it set up. Um, and uh, apparently, guys like Patricia, guys like Hugh Jackson, uh, are, are okay with that. Um, <clears throat> we don't know Hugh Jackson. Obviously, he's interviewed with the 49ers and the Browns. And by the way, there is nothing necessarily more attractive except perhaps the weather that's it uh, about the west coast Francisco that's job, what they got the Cleveland Browns <laughs> job. they got it in in uh, uh you know york and balky and that that crowd out there they've got if you think the browns front office is screwed up uh, i follow a couple of a couple of the beat guys kawakami i think is the guy's name out there in, in uh, san francisco beat writer for the 49ers it's uh it's a mess out there as well. Oh, I agree. Uh, Browns fans, hey, you know the mess that the Browns are in? Imagine if they were in the Super Bowl three years ago. Imagine if they were the team that everybody was talking about following the model because they were – remember it was going to be the 49ers and, and and Kaepernick and Seahawks and Russell Wilson battling it out for a decade. They were going to they were gonna be the new Aikman versus Montana or whatever quarterback matchup that you want out there in the uh, in the NFC. And look at how quickly. That's why I say they're, they're every bit as dysfunctional. You want to use that word about the oh, Browns yeah, or the whatever. Oh, and every bit as bad. I mean, they came yes. to, you know, one t- – the one team that the Cleveland Browns absolutely dominated this year was the San Francisco 49ers. Right. Uh, you know, put up, a, you know, 230 yards rushing against them. So, yeah, that, that job is not necessarily this uh, shining beacon uh, that uh, is drawing uh, qualified candidates to San Francisco. So, Hugh Jackson, you know, interviewed with both, hasn't been offered by either one, they say. 
Um, and by the way, what you said about the assistant coaches, they haven't necessarily said that uh, DiFilippo and his other three coaches will remain. They've said that they will remain if the new coach is amenable right, right. to they're, them remaining. Yeah, they're allowed to uh, remain. So, yeah, I got yeah, you. They, I got they're, you. They're, they're asked to remain or they, they have value to the organization, presumably. The other ones were uh, just flat <laughs> let go. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so, but anyway, uh, you know, as far as the coaching search goes, I um, – I think there is some value, as I said last week, to, to making a decision relatively quickly. Let me just let me ask of, you just because of the fact that you need to, to to do your best once you get someone in place to try to keep your best players in town. I'm pretty sure that that, that you are going to be with me as far as not a chance. I mean, not even a a infinitesimal decimal point of a chance. Lovey Smith, I got to throw the name out there because. When when he came loose, that was just my one little wild card that I said, man, maybe there's you know th- that's a guy that I would be all about. But there's not a, to me there's not a chance in the world he's he's old school football to the heart. I mean, simply by his age bracket alone, I don't see him as coming in and having a bunch of guys with glasses on and statistic boards telling him uh, what he should know about football. Uh, I do think that he would be interested in proving that he he's not done in the NFL but uh he had full control in Tampa Bay of his team he wouldn't have that here I just think there's no chance but boy man that's the kind of guy to me that you need to shepherd an organization full of what's going to be very young football players to hopefully get to a better place well it would be a good idea for them to bring him in uh and and talk with them uh if nothing else, to pick his brain, but obviously, uh, and he took a year off, I guess, I understand, last time he got fired yep. uh, after Chicago. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> but the bottom line is this, uh, Lovey Smith went 10-6 and six in Chicago and still got fired. Uh, since he got fired in Chicago, the Bears have not won 10 games again. Um, he, he went to Where Tampa have we Bay heard that and, before? And he took, took, a team that, took a team that won, what, two games a year ago, I believe, and then uh, and they won six games this year. Uh, and he's fired. Uh, you know, he's got a he's got a resume. He's got a track record. He certainly is credible uh, and respected around the league. And um, the Browns could do a lot worse, certainly, and quite likely will uh, than Lovey Smith. Uh, and it would be a good, uh, a smart move to bring him in and give him an interview and just uh, pick his brain, see see what he thinks about uh, whether he could buy into this structure. I think so too. I think you're foolish if you do not if you have not already made a phone call and just said, "Hey, would you let me take you to lunch? I'll fly down to wherever you're at." And then Jimmy has him. He's gone around the country and talked to everybody else. Go talk to Lovey Smith, and you may find uh, some common ground. Something that I've seen. I, I was reading Terry Pluto over the weekend as he was talking about his thoughts on the coaching search. And he went right back to what you and I have talked about. Look at the the trend already as guys are are talking to teams and getting hired for positions. And one of the biggest things that you're seeing is uh, control of the players on the team, not just the 46 on game day, but the 53 in general. Uh, Adam Gaze got that, and I think that was the game changer that that knocked the Browns out of any consideration when he went to uh, Miami, and I think that you'll see the same thing here. I think that most of these guys, I mean, Lovey Smith had that. He would obviously want that, and the fact that the Browns have already admitted that that's not in the cards eliminates the majority of these guys from even talking about them. You're right, and and it certainly eliminates the guys who have track records as NFL head coaches. Yep. Now that might not be the case with Hugh Jackson. We don't know that yet. He does have uh, what one year as a head coach with the Oakland Raiders, uh, but he's the only candidate that they're even interviewing that's ever held the position of head coach in the NFL. Uh, and we don't know whether the 49ers or the Browns. Uh, we know the Browns won't give him 53 man responsibility. Uh, don't know if the 49ers are prepared to do that or not. Uh, and we understand, I guess, what the Giants are also going to talk with you, Jackson. So uh, I, I guess those would be his three most likely landing points. And you'd think right now he's probably the leading candidate for probably the Browns' job, if not uh, also the 49ers' job. Oh, yeah, you would think so, at least with the with the candidates they've talked to so far. So I don't think this thing wraps up anytime soon for the Browns, I think, uh 
I think we, we're definitely going to go through another week of this. We'll see what, what they do by the time you and I get back here on Wednesday. I know that we'll have, uh, football-wise, the NFL's uh, first weekend is over, but we'll have a, the final weekend. The final weekend wraps up here. College football wrapping it up. We will have a national champion. Are you looking forward to that here tonight? Oh, I am very much. I, I think it's going to be an entertaining game. A lot of people are are thinking that Oklahoma, that Alabama is just going to walk uh, walk over them? I, I really do not think so. I think it's going to be uh, probably low scoring, uh, but uh, I think Clemson's going to go toe to toe with them. I really do. I uh, I'm pulling for our Clemson win. I hope it's just not my heart talking instead of my head. But uh, I do think that Deshaun Watson is is such a dynamic player uh, that uh, and they've got you know they've got a balanced team. Offense, defense, run, pass, and, and they are just uh, tremendously athletic. I'm talking about Clemson. Uh, they have the athletes to stay on the field with Bama, and uh, you know, quite possibly the game will, will you know, turn on a, a momentum switch, a turnover, or whatever, like like it so often seems to do. Um, Alabama probably is not going to let happen to them what happened to them last year, which is. Uh, you know, they got up early in the talk about the Ohio State game. They were up 21-6 to six in the second quarter and and figured out a way to lose that game, but uh, it really got dominated from that point on. They will they will run the ball and run the ball and run the ball some more, uh, and uh, I think they're going to try to focus on that much more than they did a year ago, and that that being the lesson that they had learned from, uh, from Ohio State. I, I did hear this morning something interesting, that, that uh, Clemson has been – trying to pick the brain of one Tom Herman um, to figure out how in the world he uh, had yeah. a running back run for 240 yards against Alabama a year ago and, and in general put up 570-some yards of total offense against Alabama a year ago uh, to, uh, to figure out whatever Tom Herman knew about Alabama. And, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, he's able to give him some help because it would be great if uh, Clemson had some of that figured out. Yeah, for sure, man. This is going to be a good one here tonight. I'm very interested to see how this one shakes out. You got Clemson 14 and 0. You got the Crimson Tide at 13 and 1. You mentioned Ohio State a couple of times in there. Looking back to last year, the, I think the uh, the committee wishes Ohio State was in it too. When you look at the ratings, what are they down 40 40 uh, percent through the playoffs from uh, from a year ago? And I think I think that's kind of natural. A, I think maybe maybe a good 15 20 percent of that anyway is the first year buzz of it. But I think a lot of that is Ohio State and the interest that they have nationally, the large fan base that they have. And uh, I think that made a, a difference as well. Is that what you think? Well, I think both of those factors are lesser factors than New Year's Day, New Year's Eve. True, very you know, true. That, yes. And, and there's yes. A, there has been a lot written about that. In fact, I just read a really good piece this morning about that. I will send it to you as soon as we're off the phone here. Okay. Uh, talking about that and how how – you know, you had advertisers, major sponsors, uh, the Tostitos people of the world, and the Chick Fil A's and Coca Cola, that would you know took baths uh, this year in, in terms of the ratings and the money that they put up versus last year. There are there are lots of forces trying to you know apply themselves to the to the CFP committee to get them to rethink this every you know, two out of every three years. They're going to be playing these games on New Year's Eve, and New Year's Eve this year was a disaster for them. Uh, you'll recall that the Oklahoma Clemson game, when Oklahoma led at the half of that game, uh, and that was the uh, you know uh, the, the game. You know, people obviously gave up on that game later, but I don't think you can attribute the ratings drop to the caliber of the games. Obviously, Michigan State you know laid a big egg, and, yeah, and that, that I'm sure hurt those ratings. But more than anything else, and I think most people agree, is that the, having those two games on New Year's Eve when people obviously have other plans uh, was uh, was the big blunder, and they're trying to do something about that, although it doesn't look like they will. And the, one of the big problems with that, Jerry, is that the, the Rose Bowl, you'd have to go to the Rose Bowl and say, hey, Rose Bowl, you know, I know you've had a 5 o'clock start New Year's Day for <laughs> like 100 years. Let's but how change about that. Your games? So we can have these, and the Rose Bowl basically just says, "Screw you, we're not doing it." They they have that much power. Dan Wetzel's column the other day had a, did a great job of pointing that out. Uh, that uh, the power of the Bulls, especially the Rose, the big daddy of them all, um, 
just simply was not flexible to consider stepping aside for a couple of uh, players. Now, obviously, the first year, last year, when the Buckeyes in Alabama, they played the Rose Bowl, and that was one of the semifinals. But that only happens every three years as they rotate through these six bowl games to have their two semifinals, the two different bowl games each year in a three-game series. So only once every third year will the uh, Rose Bowl, the Orange Bowl, like last year, be um, – you know, or Rose Bowl, Sugar Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, I should say, uh, will, will be like they played them in, uh, in in the 2014 season on on New Year's Day in their typical traditional bowl game slots. So that to me is the biggest factor, and uh, you know it's going to be a tug of war between now and a year from now uh, because these uh, the people that took a bath on the ratings this year aren't going to want to do it again, let alone oh, two yeah. out of every three years going forward. For sure, man. I mean, what was it I saw? Was it $20 million in make goods or something like that that ESPN had to do for the uh, for the playoff games from New Year's Eve? And that's a, a great point, too, as well there. Huge difference there. We'll see. With the, with the, with, there's nothing really on the slate here, and uh, they got the schedule to themselves. And they got an interesting storyline besides uh, two of the best teams here. You've got a, a strong you know, Alabama fan base, got an undefeated Clem, uh, Clemson squad. But, you know, you've got the, the coach that played on the team. Team now coming back to to face his former college. I think that's pretty interesting with Dabo Sweeney and him going to alumni. He played on the 92 uh, title team for Alabama, and so now he's heads up with Nick Saban and, of course, Saban, one of the best coaches of, of his or any other generation. So we'll see what the ratings do. Should be a hell of a game. I mean, really, can Clemson's offense get some stuff accomplished against Saban's defense? That'll be the biggest question, as you mentioned, Um Interesting to see how that goes, but uh, gonna be a lot of fun. I think this will be a good one here tonight. And uh, I don't know about you, who do you have coming out of this one? Let me, I'll, I'll put it to you first. Who do you have winning this one? Well, I, I guess my, my heart says Clemson, my head says Bama. I, I, I'm just gonna go with Clemson just because uh, I, I just get this feeling that Alabama is just a little bit too full of themselves. Uh, and I think that Clemson is gonna be playing with a little bit more of an edge, with a little bit more of a uh, of an us against the world mentality, and maybe just in terms of motivation, uh, has a little bit more in the tank. Uh, so I, I'm going to go in on the limb and, uh, and go with the underdog pick and, uh, and and bet on Clemson not just to cover but to win the football game. Yeah, I think my I'm going to pull for underdog uh, here. I, I look at Clemson that way, even though they're the the number one seeded team. I kind of look at them as the underdog, and and, and they've had a hey, you know, hey, Sweeney did a good job of getting that uh, program back and and building it back from the depths of where it was when they had all kinds of trouble and uh, uh, eligibility issues and everything, and then they got themselves back into that. So I, I'm going to pull for them, even uh, even though, like you said, I think maybe common sense says Alabama. I'm going to go with Clemson here, and we'll see if they can finish an undefeated season or if uh, Alabama can be a one-loss national champion. We'll know for sure when we come back here on Wednesday. Sounds good. Let's see what else. What do you, is what do you think? Here. What do you think about your Cavs in our seven game winning? Well, season? that's what I was going to ask you real quick before I let you go here, man. Because the next week, yeah, the, the winning streak is good, but the winning streak, it, it's is this is one of those ones you should do during the season. You get a run of weaker squads for the most part, and you, you go out there and you handle your business. I mean, look at this winning streak since you dropped those two Christmas and 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 the uh, the day after in Portland. You knocked off the Suns, the Nuggets, the Magic, the Raptors, which is a, a stronger team, the Wizards, the Timberwolves, and the 76ers. So at least four or five out of the seven are games that you should have won. Like that's what I expect. I think the next the next week is obviously a huge. Uh, Test. I, don't know, I guess midseason kind of gauge because you've got the monsters of the West, the four, four of the best in the West going against the Cavaliers. You've got the Mavs, which is probably the weakest of the four, but then you've got the Spurs, the Rockets, and it comes back home when they wrap up the uh, the road trip and come back a week from today. They've got Golden State, first time they meet since Christmas Day. So I think this will be a really good uh, test of where the Cavs are right in the middle of the season. And this is that right in that time, second week of January, when the Cavs finally started to make their their progression towards the playoff Cavs last year. So it's a good place to start that here because this is a, a good test after. Yeah, seven was good, but do you agree that was that was a, a winning streak you should have gotten as you look at the squads that you played? Yeah, I think more than that, it, uh, you're, you're, you 
set out on a seven game road trip and what you don't want to do is come home from that seven game road trip like two and five or something you've already got uh, three so, in so the belt the, yeah so the, so you've got the three under your belt already before you before you play game four you've obviously got your your one and only trip through through texas uh you know in the regular season uh, uh ahead of you now with three games against three good teams and um it was interesting the other night uh, watching the game that was on ESPN. It wasn't the Timberwolves game. It wasn't the Sixers game the other night. But it was a game that Van Gundy was doing. Uh, whenever I have a chance to avoid having to listen to Harvey Oh, me Carr, too. I, Van Gundy's I, awful. I, I, I oh. do it. And Van Gundy was all over the Cavs in their offense. Of course, they scored 120-some points that night. And uh, that was the third night in a row they had done that. He was raving about uh, what, a, what a finely tuned offensive machine the Cavs look like nowadays. And he's right. Um, they are fun to watch, and Kevin Love uh, is a big part of that with his uh, unselfishness and with his passing and, and with his just sort of a team approach to the whole thing. Obviously, LeBron has always had that. Uh, Kyrie being back, I, that was the night I think Kyrie you know, put up some numbers, and uh, and Kyrie's just been you know off the air here over the last several games. He didn't have a huge game against the Sixers, but. Uh, prior to that, he had been going off with uh, 20-something almost every night and just doing it in spectacular fashion. You know, you hold your breath every time you see him go to the hole because you're just so afraid <laughs> he's going to get hurt again. But uh, he is not showing any hesitation, any fear, any, uh, uh, you know, care for his uh, physical well-being. Uh, he's just getting after it. And, uh, man, they are fun to watch when he is doing that. Yeah, absolutely. But you know what? It, it, all, offense is good, but I'm telling you, man, the Cavs are really starting to lay uh, lay down every night on their defense, which is the the team that I want them to be because, as we saw in the playoffs, they can be. You look at the, just this seven-game streak, and quality of competition aside, only two teams have cra- actually won at right at 100. They, Toronto, that was uh, uh, 122 to 100. So technically, uh, counting that, six of the seven teams have been at 100 points or less, uh, five of the seven under 100. I mean, look at some of these in this winning streak, 87 uh, 97, 79, 100, 115, and then 99 and 85 last night. Uh, even LeBron last night after that game, talk about, hey, LeBron, big game, 37 points, and and he was fired up. He mentioned the same stat that I talked about last week. So clearly, let's not act like these guys don't, uh, don't know what time it is when they say, oh, I don't pay attention to the stats. They know. LeBron knew that he had been having not just the worst shooting season of his career, but outside of the paint, he was dead last. In the NBA, up through two weeks ago, shooting percentage outside the paint out of every player in the NBA. LeBron clearly noticed that, and he said that was kind of in the back of his mind. But he said after the game, it, the defense that you got to go back to our defense, and he's right because uh, me and little Jerry, my son, we were watching the game, and the final score was ninety five eighty five yesterday. But he, Jerry looks at me and goes, "Dad." Wasn't it like 82 to 79 just a minute ago? I said, yes, it was, son. And then the Cavaliers just took care of business the rest of the way, and they shut the other team down. And that's what they've got. That going back and forth and scoring points is fun to watch. But, man, that when they have the ability to lock it down and prevent the other team from scoring, man, that is uh, – that's what they're best at to me, and, and these Cavaliers are, are strong defensively. That gets me off as much as watching uh, the highlight scores, getting 125 points, all that stuff. Yeah, and I would agree, and I think that last year, starting last year but and going into this year, what they also do is close. Yes, uh, you know, yes. Down the stretch of what they did last year when they went out to Golden State and beat the Warriors by a dozen points out there in their one visit out there last year in the regular season. Uh, and, and there were several other games where games are closed for three and a half quarters and then the Cavs just close. Uh, you know, and, and that's all LeBron. That's all just determination and uh, unselfishness and, and you know sometimes it's just him taking charge and you can't you can't uh, you know credit him with being unselfish when he takes the ball and, and dribbles it for you know 20 seconds out of 24 and then takes it down the lane or puts up a three or something but it is him taking charge of things and and putting it on his own shoulders and trying to carry his own team to victory but you're right they do that as much on the defensive end as they do on the offensive end I talk about closing uh, they they can put yeah. the clamps on a team down the stretch and and just finish games that are close until it really matters and then the Cavs can close it. 
yeah, they, they have that ability to just a couple of plays and they turn it into a run. And next thing you know, and closing quarters. And those are all things, even when LeBron was in Miami, those were real tenants of his squads there and stuff that he learned as they finally won a championship was, you know, the final minute of every quarter is key because LeBron's teams have always been good, at least, like I said, since he went to Miami and really kind of matured into the NBA player that he is now that final minute or so where you could take a game that's a two-point game and you go on a quick six, eight-point run at the end of a quarter and and those add up quickly to turn it into uh, getting games out of control. Cavs are good at all of that and defensively. And, 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 man, as I sit here and look, you got the next four. But really, even beyond that, you've got a lot. The next, up through the beginning of February, it's a great litmus test for where the Cavs are. Because, as you said, you got the three-game Texas road trip. You come back home for one big one with Golden State. Then you've got the Clippers at the queue a week from Thursday. The the Chicago Bulls come into town. So, uh, and then yeah, you both wrap those, up. Both those teams are on big win streaks, folks. Right, absolutely. And you wrap it up with San Antonio again, and you start February with Indiana, who is to me a a team that even though they're they're growing, I think they match up well with the with the Cavaliers. But anyways, and they're all national TV games. You got let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games between now and the end of February, all national TV, all against top teams. So. It's it's not the be all end all, but it's a great place to see where they are. So and you like where it comes right in the middle of the season. When they come through that, they'll be past the halfway point and heading towards the second half of the season. Yeah, sounds good. You're you're right. That is a brutal schedule, and and it will tell you, uh, you know where they stand when they're all done with it. So uh, it's going to be fun watching. It's uh, it, it's great watching them every night. I mean, probably last year I didn't I didn't watch much regular season games start to finish checked a lot of them out, but I didn't watch a lot of games start to finish. I'm watching this Cavs team as much as I possibly can right now. For sure, it's man. Just, uh, it's just a, a treat to watch and, uh, you know, fundamental basketball. And, and uh, you know, they, they are one of two or three, you know, top teams in the NBA. Uh, you got that going in, and, and it's going to be a great ride to see if we can finally win a championship here in this town. Absolutely. And these next four, all later starts, which I'm a, a fan of. They're not late late night, but they're all 8.30, 9 o'clock, or 8 o'clock, 9.30 tip-offs. A little bit later than usual, too, because of the TV schedule. Man, I'm I'm fired up, man. There's been a, there's a lot to watch and keep us going. We got the NFL playoffs coming up this weekend. National title game tonight, and then uh, you and I come back on Wednesday. We will have a lot to dive into, my friend. That sounds good, Jerry. Look forward to it. I'll catch up to you then. You got it. Have a good one. My man, Dan Wismar, the man from Everybody Hates Cleveland. He's with us Mondays, Wednesdays. He'll be back with us here. Great conversation there. You guys, why don't you keep the conversation going? Last chance to get in. We're going to take our final break of the day, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more here about the Cavs, Monsters, Vikings. We'll wrap things up, talk about the news that's breaking and more. Don't go anywhere. Final segment of the sports is coming up next. Last chance to get in on the phones, 216-539-7535, the number to call, 216 216- 1-6-539-7535. Final segment of The Fix coming up next. The Sports Fix, your choice for intelligent talk. That was wonderful. Bravo. I loved that. That was great. Uh, intelligent talk. That well, was pretty good. Well, it wasn't bad. Well, there were parts of it that weren't very good. It could have been a lot better. I didn't really like it. These guys must be on the wrong station. It was pretty terrible. It was bad. It was awful. I was terrible. Get them away. Hey, boo. boo. The Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Football season is party season at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, And no matter who you root for, everyone wins at Harry Buffalo. Every Saturday is Coors Light College Football Saturday with $6 pitchers, four bottles for 10 bucks, and the Buckeyes in full HD. Every Sunday, all the Browns action with Bud Light beer specials and $10 hair of the dog pitchers. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. That's some fun. Plus, every Monday night, catch the Monday Night Football action with some of your favorite Browns players. Football season is most definitely party season, and your headquarters is Harry Buffalo North Olmstead all winter long. 
Harry Buffalo. Join the herd. Hey, everybody. Listen up. Listen up, guys. Hey, guys. Listen, listen up. up. No one should ever hit a woman. Not their wife, not their girlfriend, not their date. No woman should have to fear violence, especially not from someone they know and trust. But that's the reality for too many women. We have to change it. It's up to each of us, because even one is too many. Violence against women hurts all of us. Growing up, I was ashamed and afraid of my father when he abused my mom. The worst abuse of power is when a man raises his hand to hurt a woman. We all have to take responsibility. So if you see someone threatening a woman, step up, speak out, and get help. Dating violence hurts all of us. So step up and help end it. Because one is too many. One is too many. One is too many. One is too many. End the violence. Because it's wrong. Because one, one is too many. Here we go, bring it on in. It's time now. It's all city. We got to do it for them, dog. We got to do it for Cleveland. They're waiting on us. Every single night, every single practice, every single game, we got to give it all we got because they're going to ride with us. Everything that we do on this floor because of this city, we owe them. We're going to grind for this city. They're going to support us, man, but we got to give it all back to them. We get it done. The toughness that we have on the court is going to come from this city. Everybody, the whole city of Cleveland, that's what it's all about. It's time to bring them something special. Let's go. Bring it on in, everybody. Let's go. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Yeah. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. It's all us. Cleveland on three. One, two, three. The Sports Fix. Who are you? Uh, James Bond. Good evening, Mr. Bond. I've been expecting your call. Allow me to introduce you to my little friend, the Hold Button. <laughs> this is why Yoda only handles the phone calls on the Sports Fix. Please call him or we are doomed. Welcome back to the Sports Fix. Final segment as we wrap things up for the day. Great talk, as always, with Dan Wismar. Make sure you guys share the love. If you like what you heard today, you want somebody else to listen, share the show. Click the little share link wherever you're listening, whether you're on TuneIn, whether you're on Mixler, whether you're on Spreaker, all of the different places that you enjoy the show. Click the share and let somebody else see it on your social media and get them into the uh into the fold. Bring them on in to the Sports Fix. Thanks to Dan. He'll be back on Wednesday. BJ Riddell will be here Wednesday as well as we have a little season wrap up with him and give you a little daily fantasy football advice before we say adieu to BJ until next fantasy football season. That's all coming Wednesday. Plus, who knows who else might stop in here with us as we keep rolling. Going to catch up with Tony Brown here soon from the Lake Erie Monsters. As we get back into it, welcome into the Sports Fix. J-Rock with you here. As I said, Tony Brown, the voice of the Monsters, busy over the weekend. Monsters uh, still on the road trip. Longest road trip of the season, as we talked about. Got the uh, Monsters and the Cavs out on the road here as the uh, queue is otherwise occupied. Animals and clowns and all of that stuff. And, and the Browns aren't even there, but uh, it was too easy. They did snap the three-game losing streak the other day as the Monsters got the win in Milwaukee against the Admirals 4 nothing last week, but then Last or excuse me, Saturday night shootout loss in Grand Rapids. The Griffins knocked off the Monsters four to three in a shootout. So still a point grab there as they continue rolling. They're back at it tonight in Manitoba. They've got back to back games tonight and Wednesday night against the Moose in Manitoba. Then they wrap up this road trip. Grand Rapids, Chicago, and Rockford a week from today, a week from Wednesday, they finally return back to the queue to take on Grand Rapids as the Monsters look to stop the bleeding a bit, stem the bleeding, get themselves turned back around and headed up. They were doing well to start the season. Bit of a struggle since 
uh, midway through December for the Monsters. Hopefully they can grab a few here on the road and salvage the end of this road trip and then come on back home and start writing the ship. And again, hopefully we'll get Tony in later on this week and we'll talk some more to him about that. Lake Erie Monsters continuing their season about halfway through. Man, can you believe the winter sports are all about halfway through here already? Man, it's baseball. So Bruce, what do we got? 30 days? 30 days left until the uh, Indians start reporting for spring training. I think they may already be packing the truck just to get a head start on that thing. And next thing you know, we're talking baseball. and We're into the summer sports. And, hell, winter waited until the middle of January to get here as it is. Tell me. There's no such thing as climate change or global warming or whatever term you want to use. I didn't get snow until January 10th. So tell me that uh, something's not wacky out here in the uh, in the ozone, the atmosphere, whatever it is. There was a lot of girls spraying that hairspray, baby, when uh, when I was going to high school. I don't know about you guys, but they were polluting the atmosphere pretty good with those cans of Aquanet in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s when I was a youngin'. Uh, uh, so I'm just saying, I grew up in the era of styrofoam McDonald's containers that don't biodegrade. I grew up in an era where we didn't do nothing but destroy our environment. And uh, if you were around in the 80s, you know that that's all they did was was uh, destroy our environment for most of that. So tell me that there's no climate change as we get our first snowfall halfway through January. <laughs> In Cleveland, where it normally starts snowing by, th- uh, 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 um, uh, what was I going to say, um, uh, Halloween. We usually got our first snowfall before we got kids out there trick-or-treating. And, and now, you know, we're about to hit Valentine's Day and we get our first snowfall. So I'm exaggerating a bit, but it was almost President's Day. It was almost uh, Martin Luther King Day, man. We got halfway through January, guys. All right. Anyway, speaking of things going on, Cavaliers. We talked about them a day off here today before they start this uh, next little stretch. Should be interesting. Starts with Dallas. They got three games in Texas. And uh, defensively, as I was saying, man, that to me, uh, where the Cavaliers continue to hold their hat on what they've been doing. And I'm looking forward to seeing if they can continue doing that. Uh, I was looking at the uh, the game. And obviously, the game yesterday is a tough one. But uh, you like to see, again, the double-digit rebounding. Kevin Love continuing to... Uh, to attack that way and uh, the Cavaliers winning it on the boards, winning it defensively and uh, that's how you're going to do it and I'll be interested to see if they face some of the better offenses. I mean, obviously uh, San Antonio, they all bring different the Spurs, the Warriors, they all bring different challenges, the Rockets, you know, they've got D12, they've got James Harden they pose different challenges so I'm very interested to see the next week how this goes and then of course a week from today coming back home with uh, with Golden State in the fold. Speaking of hoops, we haven't talked a lot about Vikings hoops for a reason this season. The Vikings, as we knew, they were they were already going to be young. Then they were stripped of their their primary players that were expected to come back. They lost Grady, you know, obviously Forbes a year ago, uh, uh, Trey. So you you sit there and look at where they're at. You kind of expected this as the Vikings zero and four to start Horizon League play five and twelve on the season as they dropped one over the weekend. Nearly pulled off the upset as they were facing the twelve and four Milwaukee Panthers Vikings. Had an upset in the palm of their hand as they went on a run in the second half. They got blown out in the first half, went on a big run in the second half, but were able to, or excuse me, Milwaukee was able to hold on. It was a tough scare for them, but they won 65-62. And give the Vikings credit. Going into that game at 5-11, and Coach Waters had them ready to play some ball. It was a home game here, and the Vikings definitely uh, defended. The- Think about this. Not only were they trailing by a dozen at halftime, Milwaukee came out in the second half and went on a 6-2 run to start to have their biggest lead of the game. The the uh, uh excuse me the uh, Milwaukee came in and the Panthers hit a three-pointer 30 seconds into the start of the second half 53 to 35. Milwaukee had a lead, I mean nearly 20 points, an 18-point lead, largest of the game and then the Vikings went to work. Jabri Blunt, who is, of course, the son of Mel Blunt, the NFL Hall of Famer, uh, got to work. Vikings went on a 10-0 run, and they kept getting themselves within three, within four, and couldn't get the final bit over the hump. And as I said, 65-62, your final score. Uh, Andre Yates had 15 for the Vikings. 
to help them out in the cause, but it wasn't enough to add up to a victory. Vikings fall to 5-12. and 12. Panthers go to 12-5. and five. Tough young season here. Tough season, I should say, for the young Vikings and Coach Waters. Always a learning experience with Coach, and I'm sure this season no different for them as well. We'll talk some more about them as we do, and I'm going to look forward to getting Coach Waters in here in the near future. We'll get a mid-season talk with Coach Waters and see how he feels about the growth of his young squad for sure. Uh, I haven't talked to Coach in a couple of months. So Wednesday when we come back, we've got a lot to talk about. Talking about talking about things. We've got all kinds of stuff to get into. Latest on the Browns head coaching search. Alabama, Clemson, who's the national champions of college football? We'll know that. We are going to preview the divisional round of the playoffs. Four fantastic football games on tap. We will talk deeply about those. We'll talk some Indians news, Cavaliers latest. We'll see how they started off this three-game swing through Texas and so much more, guys. As always, BJ Riddell will be here. Dan Wismar will be here. You guys will be here. Let's do it. Same bat time, same bat channel, live at noon right here Wednesday across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond. In the meantime, tell somebody else to listen to the show and get their fix. You get yours, and we'll see you Wednesday. We love you, baby. Right back here. On the sports fix. Welcome to the Cleveland Show.